Sit down, relax. My name is Miriam Volk. December 15, I was born December 15, 1921. I was born in Kalish. It was a very nice, big city. It had museums, had schools, had university. My parents, I was an only child. My parents, mother and father, they were in a kind of embroidery business that was very famous in Kalish. That's how it went back to my grandfather and then to my father, like I said, and even now we brought it back to America. I went to a Jewish gymnasium, you know, high school. This was a high school gymnasium. Everything went smooth, was okay, until 39, the war broke out. The German came to college, and then right away, after they went to, after the Jews. The majority was evacuated outside Kalish to a ghetto because there were still quite many people there, Jewish people, that they were sick. They could not be evacuated. So they decided to make from a building, a high rise, like a hospital. They needed people a little bit not a little bit, quite a bit, to take care of these sick people. They found a man who was also in the embroidery business and that he should take care of this building. He knew my father because they were in the same business and he picked us, mom, my dad and I, to stay in this building to take care of the sick people. So I stay there in that building with my parents quite a few years until they decided, the German, to liquidate this hospital. In other words, to send the sick people by buses to exterminate him. I was a young woman, and my parents, they were still not very old or sick, they sent us to the ghetto, to Litzmannstadt ghetto, Lutsch, a very famous ghetto that they put from all the neighborhood, not only from Kalish, any people that, that still survived, they put in that ghetto. The ghetto was starvation ghetto. They were really people were dying from hunger and from sicknesses. I was there till 44, I think. The ghetto, except that we were all starving, there was some work done. Some people were sewing, some whatever they needed. The worst part of the ghetto, it was almost like concentration camp, the hunger and the sicknesses because of the starvation people got sick, very sick. And then they decided, the Germans, to liquidate the ghetto. So they sent them to Auschwitz. And I was among them to be sent to Auschwitz, my parents too. But there was a doctor there, you know, I, do you know anything about it? 
you never heard of anything about the ghetto. So I should tell you, first, when they brought us to Auschwitz, was we were going through a line. And this line... Can you tell us how you got to Auschwitz? Oh, by those trains. Can you tell us about yeah, that? You, okay. You have to remind me already yeah, because so I... Look, okay. I'm not on the From the ghetto to Auschwitz. How yes. Did you, get there? You, you heard about those trains. They shipped us from the ghetto to Auschwitz. There was no toilet, there was no air, and people were really dying there right away. It was horrible. But somehow, some people survived, some people died in, in that train, in that, uh, and we, uh, they took us to Auschwitz, like I said. First, they took us to a shower and they shaved our hair, the, ma the woman, everybody. We got naked. They suspected that the, lot, the, the, the Jewish people probably sold in gold or money or jewelry in their clothes. That's why they made us get undressed completely first. To them, they were going through all this club because it was true. When they had something, they put it in the, and they sewed in in the clothing. And then was a doctor, that Mengele, I don't know if you ever heard this, Dr. Mengele. Fifty years ago, at a railroad siding at a killing field called Auschwitz, a German SS officer named Joseph Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele, stood on the platform and with a flick of his finger sent tens of thousands to the gas chambers. Who was standing and he was choosing who goes to the right and who goes to the left. If anybody, like I was still young, and I guess they thought they can still use me, they took me, let's say, to the right, but my mom and my dad, they took them right away to the left. My mom right away went to the guest chamber, but my father, they took him to work. They didn't send him to the guest chamber, but they put him separate to send them for hard labor. The way they were feeding us there, Everybody was eating from the same dish. And all the newcomers, or they, we were hungry, whatever. I remember myself, I could not see myself eating from all these dishes that everybody ate. So I remember all these uh, old people that they were there longer, they were waiting for us. We shouldn't be able to eat and give it to them. Well, it was terrible. We were sleeping on the floor, one on top of the other. And then I have to remember, 12 o'clock at night, this was in the winter, they took us out to read to punish us, to go out almost naked at night in the winter. They were sending people to work, and they picked me to go to work because I was a pretty good-looking girl, you know. So they sent me where I could choose, pick, the clothing, I remember, to separate the clothing for other people when they come. Well, then they were sending the people, the majority, uh, to different concentration camps. The Russians were coming closer to Germany 
and to all these where, where the Jews were hiding or they kept them, whatever. And uh, they were starting to move us from one place to another far further from the Russians. In Auschwitz, I was about, about uh, six months. But then, like I said, the Russians were coming closer and the Germans were moving, started to move us to a different camp, a different concentration camp. At night, as they were taking us all, a lot of people died on the trip right away. They couldn't make it. And then, when, when it was at night, they took us to the barn, straw, and uh, that's where you, we slept. I was very fortunate that when I heard people, the farmers on that farm that we stayed overnight in the barn, speaking Polish. So I went over to them and I spoke Polish and I said to them that I, uh, that I speak Polish, that I am from Poland. Could they keep me here overnight when the Germans are will taking us again on the road and moving? They never saw a Jewish person in their life. They imagine a Jewish person, I am not exaggerating, has noses like this, horns, and eat onions. That's what they had there. They learned because they never saw, they were talking Jews, 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 Jews. But what are the Jews already? How do they look? Well, anyway, these farmers saved me. They kept me. I was so unnourished. I was eating a dozen eggs a day and cream. And, and, and food, because there were others with us there. They said, well, why keep you keeping her? Why don't you keep us more? Oh, no, you are Jews and she's not. Well, completely, that I survived, that I'm here, that I can make it to 100 years after all what I went through is a miracle. And I was there with these farmers, that Polish farmers, until the war broke up. And this was in 45, we heard that Roosevelt, we are listening to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the radio, and they said that Roosevelt died and the war is over. The mortal remains of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States during the long trial of war and the best American friend Britain ever had, are born to the White House. Here the body lies in state. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. And I, I was there, and then I, uh, they kept me, and then I figured I didn't want to be stay there on the farm and live on the farm. I wanted to go back to college, 
to find out if anybody, after all, I had aunts and uncles and cousins, although I was an only child, but there were more in the family. And I, at this, I don't remember how I got back to college from these farmers. I don't remember. This is like a dream. Then I came back to college. Nobody except the, remained there. And then I had an uncle in New Jersey, in America, my mother's brother, who came here years back, and he had the same business opened in New Jersey that we had in college. I wanted to come to America very, very much. I didn't want to stay anymore. I said, the only place, America. So they sent me a visa, and it wasn't so easy. I had to go back to Germany to be in a DP P camp, displaced person camp, for two years, mind you, to wait until I could come to America. Some of them had gone back to their homes after being freed from concentration camps, only to find they were not wanted. They bring back reports of violence from such towns as Lodz and Krakow. They tell of stones having been thrown through their windows, of threatening letters promising death if they do not leave in 24 hours. Bruised and decimated after six years of Hitler, they still have no peace. The terrorization of some of them has led to general alarm, and in the next three months, some 20,000 Jews may be added to the 35,000 now in this area. And I came to America after two years waiting, waiting, but of course the conditions were not so bad there. When I was in college, that time uh, I met, there were other people coming, looking for uh, relatives. But I got acquainted with, with, with my husband. He is from Kalish, and he found his brother in Kalish. And I was there by myself. And little by little, I said, I am going uh, to America. He wasn't so sure if he wants to go to America. He thought he wants to go to Israel, because that time, a lot, they all tried to save the Jews and take them to Israel. But I said, I am not going to Israel. I had already ghettos, and I had already one thing. If you want to go to Israel, you go by yourself. If I want to go only to the United States. And we came to the United States. Oh, we got married when we were there two years. You remember I said we were in Germany two years. We were waiting to, to, uh, for the visa to come. So we got married there. You could get married that time in Germany for a cup of coffee. Coffee was the most that the German love, even, for, even today. Coffee is the main, they do anything for coffee. Came, we got married there, and then we came to the United States. I had $60 because somebody gave me a gold watch, and I sold that watch to have some money. And I got for the $60. So I came with $60, my husband with nothing. Luckily, we were very hard working. But one thing, my husband had an education in Warsaw. He was attending the university 
in Warsaw before the war. So when he came, we came here to America, he somehow was educated, you know. I remember his first job, whatever they try, his first job was that they sending, they were sending him to Brooklyn on a subway at night because he knew how to count and separate farms or whatever, some, some kind of uh, colors. Well, little by little, they knew that he is bright. And so my family that were, were working in that embroidery business, I worked a machine on a sewing machine in America because we had in Poland a sewing machine for the factory and I learned how to sew on a, a sewing machine. So I worked and he worked. Mind you, we saved $25,000. And for the $25,000, they took my husband to the a part of the business to my uncle. We saved and we did well. He invested a little bit. Should I tell him the stock market? <laughs> we started in the Bronx. There was a Jewish organization. They took care of these Jews, newcomers. Well, little by little, hard work and saving money, we somehow succeeded that I can afford to live here. I was an only child and I had only one child, Steve. And of course, Steve got married to June, very strong woman. Hi, my name is Steve Volk. I'm Miriam Volk's only son. And today I'm gonna to show you some memorabilia and other documents about my mother's life and my father's life, Irving Volk, in Kalish, Poland before the war and immediately after the war when they were in a displaced persons camp and came to the United States. This is the Kalish book. Kalish was a small city in central Poland where both my parents were born and lived before World War II. This book contains lots of pictures and stories about Jewish life in Kalish in the 1920s and 30s. Kalish was invaded by the Germans in September of 1939 and after that my mother was sent to a ghetto in Ludz, Poland which was to the east. This picture is Miriam's grandfather Joseph Seidel and this picture is her father Sender Seidel who worked in the embroidery business. This is a certificate issued to my father Irving Volk testing that he was in Auschwitz from August 17, 1942 through May 6, 1945, and he was liberated from Mauthausen, another concentration camp, on May the 25th, 1945. After the war was over, my parents wanted to come to the United States, but they needed a visa and that was hard to get. So they stayed in a displaced persons camp or DP camp, and this is the card that was issued to them while they were in the camp. This is, a, this is the marriage certificate of my father Irving and my mother. They were married in the DP camp on December 24th, 1946. This is their wedding picture, and these are other pictures from the DP camp. After staying in a DP camp for almost two years, my parents received a visa to travel to the United States. They came to the US on a ship called the Ernie Pyle, and this is their embarkation card uh, indicating that they departed on the 5th of April, 1947. When my parents traveled to this country on the Ernie Pyle, they were loaned money by the American Distribution Committee, a relief organization. And this document, uh, uh, which was dated about 18 months after they came here, uh, asks for the loan to be repaid. It was $390, which was a lot of money at that time. My message is, first of all, I am surprised myself. My brain still works, look, without notes. I, I 
take care of myself 100 percent the the oxygen i fix myself the the tank of the max oxygen i replace myself i do everything myself and i'm hundred and a half years old the willing to survive because you see per se nobody wants to die nobody wants to die everybody wants to live